fun with mangrove wildlife today. Okay, so okay, let's, let's begin with understanding what is mangrove forest. forest. So essentially, mangrove, mangrove trees are uh, tropical trees adapted to harsh conditions because they live at the in the they are found in coastal areas, so they are actually exposed to saltish seawater as well as brackish water. Well, brackish means a mixture of salt and seawater, and then uh, they are also exposed to high and low tides. Okay, so mangroves are important because they actually help to reclaim land. Okay, it's free land reclamation services because um, because mangroves are located at the coast, so the rivers flow into empty out into the sea there. And at the river mouth, um, there's a it as the river empties out, uh, it carries with it silt and sediment, which are deposited at the river mouth. So uh, the mangrove roots actually help to retain all the um, sediments so that over time there's new land is being formed and being built up. Okay. So mangroves also help to protect the coastline against uh, wave erosion, so then the coast don't get washed away and tsunamis. Okay, so in the 204 uh, tsunami that devastated uh, a lot, uh, caused a lot of damage, uh, those entire villages were swept away when the big wave a tsunami came in and a lot of people died. But uh, those villages that were located behind mangroves actually uh, suffered a lot less damage. Okay, so mangroves are also um, nurseries and breeding ground for fishes prawns, crabs, and shellfish. In fact, a lot of uh, commercially important fishes uh, started off, started, starts out their life in mangroves. And uh, later on, they move into the coral reefs and into the seagrass beds. And uh, mangroves are part of a uh, blue carbon ecosystems, which also comprises seagrass and mudflats. And they're actually 10 times more efficient than terrestrial ecosystems at storing carbon and fighting climate change. Okay, this is because um, mangroves, they, as I said, they reclaim land. And it sequesters carbon, which means to say store carbon in the form of the trees itself and the soil. Okay, so by helping to retain the soil, uh, the, the new land means new mangroves can form and, uh, and trees over time can, because the land keeps getting higher and higher with more and more silt, so the trees get bigger and bigger. So in that sense, they store, so they store carbon, more and more carbon over time. Okay, and mangrove ecosystem, of course, supports a rich variety of plants and animals. So you can see in this picture over here um, that the mangroves actually grow in the, in the brackish water. So these are the roots that you can see. And over here in front, you can see all the little young mangrove saplings. And then all these are migratory birds, okay? This is taken at Sungai Pulau. Okay, so where are the mangroves found in Singapore? So uh, the most obvious is Sungai Pulau Wetland Reserve. Uh, Pasir Ris Park has a small and compact and good mangrove. Pulau Ubin, Labrador Park, Mandai, and so on and so forth. So this boardwalk is, I took this picture in Pasir Ris Park. It's, a, it's very pleasant. You don't have to walk in the mud. So there's a boardwalk that takes you through the mangroves and you can observe the wildlife there. And then over here, this shows a picture that I took in Sungai Bulo where the mangrove forest is flooded. Okay, because there's high and low tide. So when there's high tide, it'll be flooded. So the mangroves are able to withstand uh, salt water coming in. Okay. Okay, that's because mangroves are adapted in various ways to, for this harsh condition. So in, the, in this case, it's adapted for intertidal life where there's a changing water salinity. Salinity means, saline means saltish. Okay, so it, the, because sometimes uh, if there's heavy rain, it becomes less saltish. But when there's a high tide coming in, it becomes more saltish. So the mangrove, the roots are able to do ultra filtration, meaning that they can filter out the salt and absorb only water. Okay, they, because other plants cannot survive in such conditions, they will all die because they, they will absorb the salt and die. But mangrove are able to filter out the salt and um, all mangrove plants can do that, but some do it more efficiently. Others that uh, take in some salt, they actually will secrete the salt crystals uh, using the salt glands on the surface of leaf. So over time, the salt is uh, will dry out and then the wind will blow it off or rainwater will come and wash it off. And salt also is accumulated in older leaves uh, which drop off. Okay, and mangroves can also um, withstand dehydration because it's thick, waxy and hairy leaves. Okay, wax will help to retain the water within the leaves. Okay, then they also are adapted for mud substrate, meaning that mangroves are not, not grown on solid land. They are growing in very soft mud. Okay, if a human walks there, we will all sink in. Okay, I walked in, in a, a few mangroves before, I sink up to my knees and you can even sink up to your waist level. Okay, so mangroves have uh, area roots, also called pneumatophores, which actually can help to breathe air. Because why? Mud is very anoxic, meaning that it's very low oxygen content. and um, you need roots that are above the ground, okay, to be able to uh, absorb air directly. So there are a few kinds of roots you can see here, prop roots. Okay, over here, this picture shows prop roots um, where 
where the, the roots are above the ground and help to support the plant in unstable mud, as well as breathe air directly. Okay, pencil roots, you can see over here, like thin little pencils sticking out. Okay, so then the, the actual, the lateral roots, which are underground, okay, help to, this uh, Avicenia here has lateral roots underground and then prop roots being sent up like a snorkel to breathe air directly. Okay, then this picture shows the knee roots, okay, roots that looks like bare knee cap. Okay, like this knot over here. And cone roots later on, I'll show you pictures of it and buttress roots, okay? So as I said, uh, the underground roots also obviously secures the tree in a very unstable mud. And sometimes there are storms, so the mangrove trees don't collapse because they are very um, stable. Uh, as in, not all collapse, of course, it's, it's, if it's really severe, it will collapse. And then it's able to withstand currents also. And they're also adapted for reproduction because they have this, um, this unique feature called baby peri. Okay, what does this mean? Baby peri means it's able to, um, the seedling, normal trees, the seeds are only grown, um, <clears throat> only start to sprout when they are in, away from the parent tree. But for mangroves, the seeds start to sprout when they are already uh, still attached to the parent tree. So they actually get nutrients from the parent tree and they grow a long root. So you can see over here in this picture, this is, this green thing here is actually the root that grows out. Okay, and it's still on the parent tree, it gets a lot of nutrients. And then at some point it falls off. And this, this whole thing structure is called a propagule. Okay, crypto river very means that uh, it's already sprouted in the parent plant, but it's hidden inside the fruit wall, so you cannot see it, so it's crypto. Okay, so this propagule is able to float in water and it, is it, um, and it is big, can disperse to other mangroves, uh, other new newly formed mud to establish themselves there. And the propagules also provide a good store of food. So then the propagules can survive at weeks and months to, uh, to weeks to months at sea. Okay, so over here you can see that I have a photograph an emerald dove walking amongst young cichlids. So you can see this is the propagule. Half of it is exposed, half of it is married in mud already. Okay, because they become, because the tip that is in the supposed to be a root tip absorbs water, whereas the tip on top actually repels water. So this becomes heavier and it will bend downwards. Okay, at first it floats horizontally, it becomes vertical, it establishes in itself in mud and starts to sprout out. Okay, so these are all the young seedlings that are growing. So let's introduce you to some mangrove trees. Um, the One of the most common is Avicenia, also called api api, it's a Malay word. Api means fire, that's because these mango trees actually uh, display grounds for fireflies. So at night, the fireflies come and they like to flash there. So you can uh, take some fireflies tour in, um, <clears throat> I've taken those tours in Kota Tinggi River, but uh, in Singapore, sometimes you do see them, okay? So you can see this Abyssinia is the one with the pencil roots over here, you can see. And this Abyssinia alba has um, white leaves underneath and the fruit is this teardrop shape. And this has crypto river berry, it means that the fruits are, I mean, the seeds are sprouted inside but it's still hidden within the fruit wall. Okay, Bacau, there are two, two um, <clears throat> genuses, Bruguera, uh, which has the knee roots over here, and they have a long uh, hypocortal, and the leaves look like this. Okay, As another type of Bacau is the rhizophora. This Bacau actually form the bark of the mangrove forest, about 70 to 90 percent. Okay, so Bacau, um, this one over here is a rhizophora species, and are all prop roots. Okay. You can see the roots very distinctive um, and very, very long hypocortal. You can see it's about nearly uh, 30, 40 cm long, okay? Then Sonorasia are uh, cone roots, okay? Another thought, it looks like pencil, but a bit fatter at the base. And they have pom-pom kind of flowers, okay? Which are open only at night. And, uh, and there are food source from bats and moths. And the fruits are non, they don't grow very long roots. So they are more like uh, apple shape, okay? So these are the type of roots. All these are aerial roots that you can see that can breathe air directly. And then uh, mangroves are in the... Okay, so just now I was talking about api api and sonorasia. These two uh, attract fireflies and because they are towards the seaward side, that means they're usually the first to arrive uh, in the newly formed mud and then they will start to grow there. And the bakau normally found in the further towards the landward side of the mangroves. Okay, but then there's also this concept called back, back mangroves which means to say it's behind the mangroves. These are the trees that are found there. So one is sea hibiscus. Uh, they also um, <clears throat> are able to, okay, sea hibiscus is a heart-shaped leaf, has this nice uh, yellow flower, 
that looks like a hibiscus. Okay, previously it was in a hibiscus genus, but it's been renamed to Tulipariti. Okay, so basically the hibiscus flower um, is actually related to the lady's finger. That's why they, the flowers actually look very similar. And the uh, sea hibiscus is an important plant in traditional communities because the bark is used to form fibers, which can be uh, plated to form ropes that fish and uh, fishing nets as well as uh, even fishing line okay, to, to catch fishes. And um, they, the fruits, are, the seeds are actually eaten by these cotton stainer bugs. Okay, so these little red uh, bugs are actually cotton stainer bugs. Okay. Then there's also the sea holly that looks like the Christmas holly, uh, but it is not related at all. And uh, it, is, it actually secretes, um, because it's found very near the mangroves, the back mangroves, they, it also uh, is subjected to some salt water. So it's able to secrete the salt on the surface of the leaves, uh, which are blown off or washed off by rain. Okay, so it looks like this. And this is a little shrub, about um, about 50 cm tall. Okay, another back mangrove tree is a sea poison. Okay, see, sea poison has pom pom fruits like the sonorasia, and um, sorry, pom pom flowers, and they produce fruits that look like a lantern. And this is called sea poison. Why? Because um, fishermen in the past used to uh, take the lantern, and the seeds have uh, this poison called saponins which uh, when they crush it up, they put it into the water, the fishes eat it, they become stunned. So they can't really move and then you can catch them easily. But it's actually a destructive kind of fishing method because it kills a lot of other things as well. Okay, so now of course it's not being used. Okay, sea almond, uh, this is a very common tree. This tree you can also find in roadside plantings. It's, it's actually one of those trees that can, uh, the leaves can suddenly be, can become red uh, because it sheds its leaves twice a year. So before it sheds its leaves, uh, in January and around July, uh, it actually turns red and falls off. Okay, so you can see that these very big leaves. Okay, so I see almond because um, the this is actually uh, has a husk around the stone which is in the middle, and inside the stone there's a kernel that tastes like almonds. Okay. Uh, okay, back mangrove. There's also a Nepal palm. This is a very important tree in the traditional community because Nepal is actually atap. Is the is the source of your favorite uh, atap tea, okay? Which is fine, ice ice kacang. Uh, the atap tea is in the fruits, okay? And then the leaves are used to form atap houses. So in the past, uh, people used to live in houses that are made of this atap houses made of this uh, palm, okay? So this um, mango palm seems to not have a trunk. It seems to grow out directly from the uh, the stem. It doesn't seem to have a stem because. It's actually a lateral stem over here. You can see a horizontal stem, and then the stalks just go out directly. Okay, and this can be about nine, ten meters tall. And um, the the fruit, the flowers. Uh, this is the male and flower, and this is the female, which looks like a cone. And it's being you can be tapped to produce toddy, which is kind of alcoholic drink. Okay, so we'll move on to talk about marine life. Um, so basically, mudskippers, uh, you can. The biggest of which is the giant mask keeper, which can be about 20 cm long. And in the day, it has this the stripe that lateral stripe, but sometimes at night it looks like uh, it has stripes on the back like that. Okay, so it's essentially it's the biggest thing. Um, mask keepers are unique fishes because they're able to come onto so-called come onto land and even walk on land. So these pectoral fins are able to function like mini crutches that is able to propel itself up, okay, to walk. Uh, even to climb trees somewhat, okay? And uh, the dorsal fin can be used as signals. That means it uses the fin to flash it up and down to talk to other mask keepers. And uh, it's able to breathe out water because if the skin is moist like a frog, it can breathe through the skin. And it actually uh, has a water tank in its mouth and in its gill chambers. And uh, over time, the, uh, it will be able to absorb oxygen, but uh, you need to, the Mask needs to go back to water to replenish uh, with fresh oxygenated water. Okay, so the this mask keeper is a predatory, um, predatory is in a sense that it eats uh, worms and all that. But um, the yellow spotted mask keeper is more of eating algae. Okay, so there's also a, um, about five more species of mask keepers, like the blue spotted, gold spotted, slender mask keeper, dusky cat mask keeper. Okay, so they're actually different types, but the biggest is a giant uh, because it's really huge. And this giant mask keeper is even eaten in Taiwan. So before you eat it, you need to um, put it into fresh water to get rid of the muddy taste. Oh, then once, uh, then after that, they actually eat it, which I, which I haven't tried. <laughs> okay, 
So basically, in mangrove, you as you walk through the boardwalk, let's say at Pasiris, you can actually come across tree climbing crabs. Okay, these crabs are unique because they can climb trees. And uh, why do they do that? Because they actually feed on the leaves of the trees. Just now those trees that I introduced earlier. And they are um, they also do it to escape from uh, predators that are brought in by the high tide. Right? Because when it's high tide, the water comes in, there are big fishes that swim in that could eat up these crabs. So of course, these crabs uh, climb the tree to escape from that. Okay, there's also another mango tree dwelling crab, which uh, it looks a bit similar to the tree climbing crab, but it has some stripes on it. And uh, there are also mud crabs, which uh, can be eaten by humans. Uh, there are three species of mud crabs in Singapore. So this is likely the orange mud crab. And um, the, the very big crabs that we eat in, let's say in a seafood restaurant, is usually the Sri Lankan crab, which is not the same as this. These are the local ones, slightly smaller. Okay. And then this uh, horseshoe crab is, uh, some people call it a living fossil because it's been around for 400 million years. And the horseshoe crab, I photographed this pair breeding in a Pasir Ris Park at night. Uh, they, they swim as a, okay, so the, as just now I mentioned mangrove are nurseries, right? So there's this, I photographed this uh, very baby horseshoe crab, which is only around size of 20 cent coin. Okay, so you can see this is uh, my husband's finger, his Tim's finger, and um, he's pointing at it. Okay, so it's really tiny. Okay, so basically the mud lobster is a very important creature. Um, it's actually not a real lobster, but it's related to a stream. And um, you hardly see it because it's a nocturnal creature. So this is important because it actually, in that sense, is believed to eat mud. And as it digs deep and eats mud, it actually uh, brings the soil from deep underneath to the surface. And it creates this kind of uh, so-called volcanoes or mud mouths. Okay, these are like, can be up to two meters tall. And this mouth is actually um, dry and uh, it other kinds of wildlife can live in it. Wildlife like snakes, sometimes, Burrow in snakes, crabs, spiders, ants, wasps. Okay, so and even a normal uh, and uh, also just now those tree coming crabs also live in in this. Uh, and the plants like the mangrove fern as well as the um, sea holly grow on it. Okay, so the mud lobster uh, I've only seen it once after so many years of walking the <clears throat> the wild places. And this is actually photographed. Uh, it can be found on the website wildsingapore.com. Okay. So you, you'll, be, you'll be very lucky if you actually come across it. Okay, then in terms of marine life, uh, because the, if you go to Sungai Bulo, you go to the main bridge, you look down, you can see this is a very common fish. It's called the striped nose pass, striped nose half big. It's called half big because the, long, the lower jaw is actually much longer than the upper jaw, which is only this tiny little bit. Okay, so it's called half big. And uh, it, has, it seems to have a luminous yellow tip and it's a very uh, longish fish. And the, one of the most famous fishes is the archer fish. Why is it called an archer? Well, because it can shoot water. Okay, so it's able to, it eats insects, which is on land. So if it spots an insect that, that is uh, on a branch overhanging the water, it can actually shoot a jug of water to, to uh, shoot down the insect into the water so they can eat it. Okay, so it's an archer fish. There are two species of archer fish. Okay, so we also have uh, cute little fishes like this spotted one over here. It's called a spotted scat. Okay, it's called scatophagus because it eats. Scat is actually uh, uh, another word for feces. Uh. So it actually can eat feces, but of course it also eats normal things. Uh. Okay, so this fish is, um, in that sense, I, I believe it's breeding air over here. Okay, and the mangrove snake eel, uh, I've photographed this at night in Pasir Ris Park. Okay, it looks like a snake, but it's actually an eel. Okay, how do you tell it's not a snake? It's because it has these two little fins. Can you see the fins? Okay, over here. Okay, so, um, Okay, other marine life include the nerite snail. Okay, these are nerites are quite common. This light one is one of the most common. It's usually stuck on the rocks and even mangrove roots. And leaf oyster, uh, this can be harvested to be eaten, but uh, of course we leave them alone now in the wetland reserve. Okay, okay, and night, um, or you can see this stock face water snake coming out. Uh, it used to be a lot more numerous, but it seems like in recent times the mangrove uh, seem to be drying out and there's less numerous. Basically, they swim in the water. They look for fishes to eat. Uh, okay, and this one I photographed here, it has a prehensile tail it, to grab onto a branch so that it doesn't, it's not swept away by the currents and it's actually looking for fishes. Uh. And this one over here is looks um, very cloudy kind of skin because it's about to molt. 
moth needs to change its skin. Okay. And uh, the shoppy viper is a very venomous snake. It's a viper which can be seen in Sumai Bulo, quite a lot of places, uh, even Sentosa in the and uh, it's able to, it's an ambush predator. You can see down here it's in ambush position. It actually eats uh, lizards and frogs and other things. And uh, essentially it's waiting for something to walk by and then it will shoot itself out to catch it. Okay, it's still is also prehensile, means that it can grab onto the branch so that it doesn't, the whole snake doesn't fall off. Okay. Paradise tree snake is one of uh, a very unique snake because it's able to so-called fly. It's actually able to glide from branch to branch. So what it does is that at the, it climbs up a tree and um, it's able to launch itself off the tree and fly to the next tree because it can flatten its body to catch the air underneath. Okay, so you can see here that you see the body is a bit flat on this portion. Okay, because the whole thing can flatten out a bit. Okay. Oriental witch snake is uh, pretty common. So the oriental witch snake that is found in our mangroves are up to two meters long, which are the longest witch snakes around. Okay, they, they are, I mean, um, you might not be able to spot it, but if you look closely, it's because it looks like a piece of vine, okay? Like uh, any other vines like the one behind here. And the Malayan water monitor is the second largest lizard in the world after the Komodo dragon. And um, it is, it can be about two meters long. This is an adult over here, but the young monitor lizards are able to climb trees. Adults don't really climb trees because they're a bit too heavy. So I photographed this pair of adults, they're actually wrestling with each other. Okay, two males wrestling for territory. Okay, um, it's quite funny because this, this males, they, while they're wrestling each other, there were about four or five authors around them, very excited audience uh, jumping up and down. Okay, but they were like egging them on to fight. Okay, and then this um, monitor lizard obviously can swim. Uh, it eats fishes. You can, uh, I've seen them eating toman, which is a huge uh, giant toman before. Okay, so of course, uh, mangroves itself uh, are nursery grounds, so the crocodiles might uh, be found there. So in this case, these crocodiles can be seen in Sungai Bulo. Um, this is a, a crocodile in Sungai Bulo can be two to four meters long, and this one is uh, it's still not rich adulthood because adult crocodiles are fully um, dark colored. Okay, but this one has a bit of yellow on it. Okay, so this young crocodile has a lot of yellow on it. And this crocodile, when they float on water, if you look here, you can see the little the teeth sticking out. Okay, so crocodiles have teeth sticking out, whereas alligators don't have. Okay, the salt crocodile crocodile is also the largest crocodile in the world. Uh, it can be up to nine meters long, but we don't get such giants here. It's maybe in the nine meters one are found in Australia, where they are actually protected. Okay, so for birds, um, there are birds that are mangrove specialists, means that they're mostly found in mangroves. Well, the co copper throated sunbird um, has a copper throat uh, and is iridescent kind of feathers. And um, the, this is the male and this is the female. So the time when I did farm with backyard birds, I introduced the concept of sexual dimorphism. So the male and female uh, look different because uh, they are sexually dimorphic. Okay, sexually means different male and female, and then dimorphic means two different moths. Moths means uh, way, the way in which they look. Okay, white fan tail. Okay, this bird is a, it likes to fan out its tail, okay, like a fan. And um, it can close the fan and open the fan. Okay, okay. and uh, it's very, very uh, fidgety bird, and it, it's flighty and fidgety. Okay, the ashy tailor bird is, uh, has an orange head. And uh, is the tailor bird actually um, is able to sew leaves together and to uh, so that it can nest in within them. Okay. Then okay, obviously there are a lot of birds. Okay, so the backyard birds that I covered, some of them are found in the mangroves. Uh. So I only have time to highlight some birds here. So one of the birds that you can see is the oriental pike hornbill itself. So I photographed this at Sungai Bulo. Pasir Ris Park also has, and quite a lot of other places, and Pulau Ubin, of course. Um, so the oriental pyhibrid, this is a male with a big cask. This thing on the uh, above the beak is the cask, which helps to stabilize the very big bill. And um, it is uh, it is do doing well in Singapore now, okay? Because uh, the nest blocks are created and they're also nesting holes. Okay, white-breasted water hen is a bird that you can see quite easily, even in um, even along the park connector as Serangoon River, okay? So basically it is uh, walking, it has very uh, huge toes that spread out its weight so that it can walk on lily pads. And uh, it's, 
able to walk in the soft mud without sinking in and to forage for food. Okay, little egret is also can be, uh, obviously it's found in mangroves, but can also be found uh, fishing. These two egrets, uh, herons are found um, in canals fishing. Uh, okay, so the little egret can be recognized because it's white, black legs and yellow feet. Okay, yellow feet, like brachukang boots. And the striated heron uh, is, is quite inconspicuous if you don't look, but if you see, it's actually over there, fishing away. Okay, so this striated heron is quite a clever bird because in the past, somebody have observed it in the botanic gardens using bread that people throw. So you actually take the bread, pick up the bread and throw it and attract fish to it so that the fishes are nearer so that you can catch the fish for itself. Okay, so this bird is actually very clever. It's, it's quite, it's a very uncommon that a bird can, is able to use a tool. Okay, little egret has been known to uh, spread out its wings so that it create a kind of a shade shadow. And then little fishes like to, like us, we prefer the shade. So fishes will gather under the shadow and then of course the bird will eat it at some point. Okay, so gray heron are bigger birds. Okay, this bird is almost one meter tall. Okay, the, the, the two herons look the same, but the purple heron has this black stripe down the neck. Okay, both have very long necks. Gray heron, um, that's a heron. Established heronry at Pasiris Park and also at uh, Pekang Quarry in Pulau Ubin. Okay, so you can see it very easily there. Okay. And purple heron is not as common, but uh, you can also find it there. Okay, so of course, uh, mud flats, um, mangroves are sometimes located next to mud flats, especially in the tropics. So the we, we have waders there. Waders are also called shorebirds, and a lot of them are migratory. So uh, these two, the Wimbra as well as the common green shank, they are migratory birds that fly all the way from Siberia to Singapore. They might overwinter here or they might uh, fly on towards Australia, New Zealand or Indonesia. Okay, but those that overwinter here, they stay, that means during the northern, um, northern winter, it's too cold there and there's not enough food. So they fly down to the tropics and so that uh, they can get food here. So they have very long bill, okay because they fit in the mud flat. So a lot of uh, worms or that, they hide under the mud. So they need a very long bill to reach the worm. Okay, so this one, and this, this is the curved bill. This one also a very long bill. Okay, so this, these birds are found on the mud flats. They're actually not in the mangroves, but because mangroves are near um, mud flats, I thought I'll cover them. Okay, so of course there are a lot more uh, waders around, other species of waders. So I'd like to um, encourage you to go on walks, nature walks that the Nature Society conducts. So for myself, I run the Farm with Nature program under the education committee. So you can actually look at my, the blog, Farm with Nature blogs. Okay, you just Google Farm with Nature, you can find it. Um, these are all the, the past walks are there. And there are also walks conducted by the bird group. Okay, so essentially we uh, bring you out to nature. Of course, I encourage you to go out to explore the mangroves yourself. Just now, as I mentioned, Sungai Bulo, Pasir Ris Park. Okay, and um, if you, but at this point, because of COVID, we are not, we don't have any live box yet. We can only do webinars, but um, we, uh, nature guides in Singapore are active. I myself am one. And uh, so if you want to have a higher nature guide, you can, for your own private walks or for your school, okay, or for your company, you can contact myself I, and I can uh, link you up to nature guides. Uh. So I would like to thank uh, Ria for, and Francis for the use of their photos for today. And also for me for helping to guide us to conduct this webinar. Okay. And uh, Farm Nature webinars we have had, um, this is the fifth one so far. So I've done two myself on Backyard Birds and Farm with Otters and Farm with Hombers. They're all on the NSS YouTube channel. So please access them to learn more about our local wildlife. Okay, so now I'd like to uh, take some questions. Tim, do we have any questions? Um, okay, there are two questions so far. Give me a moment. Okay, so please feel free to type your questions in the chat box. Okay, one was, uh, does the mud skipper chase after people? I think your photo was, uh, didn't give an indication of the size of it. Okay, so the mud skipper, um, no, it's a tiny creature. It's only about 20 cm long. Okay, so basically it, it does fight against other mudskippers. Okay, usually species, uh, their males are very um, <clears throat> are very territorial. Okay, so I, sh I forgot to mention something, but if you look over here, you can see that the mudskipper 
has create little, created little swimming pools. Okay, so each is by a pair of mask keepers. Each swimming pool over here is created by a pair of mask keepers because they defend the little bit of water that they have. And underneath the swimming pool, there's actually a burrow. Okay, so during high tide, they can hide in the burrow because they can uh, absorb a, a gap of air and then they, they can withstand the high tide. They can actually breathe in very um, very low oxygen levels. The other fishes would, would die, but they can still survive. Okay, so they fight against others so that others don't come into their own swimming pool. Okay. Okay, the next question is still on mud skippers. Uh, mud skippers need to go back to the waters to get oxygenated water. Yes. Does it mean that mangrove waters are actually quite rich in oxygen besides despite the brackish colors? Oh yeah, yeah. The waters have normal level of oxygen because they can get it from the air directly. It is the mud, the mud itself that is a uh, very poor oxygen. Okay, so the trees that grow with the roots inside the mud, they don't get enough oxygen. So that's why they need to uh, evolve area roots, uh, roots that can breathe air directly. Okay. Okay, uh, next one is, why are Pulau Ubin mudskippers so big? I oh. think that's the last mudskipper question. Okay, so uh, Pulau, okay, this giant mudskipper is not just found in Pulau Ubin. They can be found in many places. Um, in uh, Pasir Ris Park. It's found uh, all over Singapore and in Malaysia too, but I'm not sure of its range in other parts of Asia, but I've seen it in Kukuk and yes. Okay, so the mask keeper is, um, the giant mask keeper is by nature big. It's not, a, whereas other mask keepers like the yellow spotted and the blue spotted are all smaller than the giant mask keeper. Okay, now here we turn to birds. What about the presence and role of raptors in the mangroves? like uh, buzzards, etc. help clean up? Question mark. Okay, so basically, um, the raptors, of course, uh, when they hunt, they do uh, hunt in the mangroves, like the white-bellied sea eagle actually fishes, looks for fishes within the mangrove river. You can see at Pasir Ris Park. And uh, the buzzards, the another honey buzzard also has been, it can be easily seen there during the migratory season. So they catch uh, things like a changeable lizard that's also found in the mangroves. Uh. Yeah, and also maybe young monitor lizards. Okay, uh, what precautions should we take when we go on such nature tours? Okay, so basically I would advise uh, spraying mosquito repellent, um, then uh, to protect yourself uh, and also sunblock, okay, against the sun, uh, wear a hat, wear, if you uh, don't want to spray repellent, just wear long sleeve and long pants, uh, wear covered shoes, when you, okay, at Pasir Ris Park especially, be careful, do not touch the railing. Why? Because sometimes there are weaver ants, which are big red ants uh, crawling on it. As, and some, the mangrove uh, pit viper is also known to be sometimes on the railings itself. So you might accidentally touch it. Okay, so I would advise not to touch the railings when you walk. And of course, look where you're walking and do not brush against vegetation because um, you might displace a hornet's nest. And then of course the hornet will come and attack you. But uh, if you actually are unfortunate enough to be attacked by hornets, run away from the nest. Do not just stay in position and do not run in circles, obviously, because the hornets have um, a certain range. They will, they will protect throughout. Uh, maybe they, maybe they, I'm not sure how, how far, but beyond a certain, uh, certain range away from the nest, it, they will stop chasing you, okay? So, uh, okay, I'd just like to invite you to take a short survey, um, scan the QR code or visit the URL over there uh, to help us uh, to find out whether you benefited from this webinar and whether um, what other webinars do you want to have. Okay, do we have more questions, Tim? Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, let me see. There's a, I heard there are fireflies in Singapore. Where or when would it be a good time to spot them at night? Okay, uh, so... No. Okay, so basically fireflies can be found in the mangroves, but they are small numbers only. Okay, the fireflies are actually a kind of beetle. Um, you can spot them, okay, at Pasir Ris Park mangroves, which is open at night. Sungai Bulo is not open to public at night. Okay, so I suppose Pasir Ris Park would be a good place. Okay. Um, but only if you're lucky, like, because they are in small numbers. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, do Pulau Ubin or Katip Bongsu have the estuary crocodiles? I kayak almost 100 times but never seen one yet. Okay, uh, Pulau Ubin, okay, the saltwater crocodiles uh, can go into 
can live in the salt water as well as in brackish water. So they are usually found in Sungai Buloh area because there's a lot of fishes there. Um, but they have been known to wander. Obviously, they came over. I mean, basically, they, they can swim anywhere. So essentially, Pulau Bin, I'm not too sure of the records as well as Katip Bongsu. Do you know yourself, Tim? Um, they have been spotted uh, just about everywhere along the Singapore coastline, but most of the time they seem to be just passing by looking for new areas. Mm. So in terms of territory, they are mostly hanging around Sungai Bulo area. So uh, that's because it's a wetland reserve. The no nothing, no wildlife is allowed to be killed in there. Okay, but of course, in, uh, throughout Singapore, with the Wild Animals Act, uh, you cannot kill wildlife also in Singapore. Okay. Okay, uh, do wild, uh, wild boars seek refuge near the mangroves? Okay, wild boars, um, don't, they can mm, forage near the mangroves, but because they might sink to the mud, I, I believe they do not go into the seaward side, but the back mangroves, they are found there too, yes. Okay, uh, there's uh, questions, uh, basically, uh, are there butterflies in mangroves? Yes, there are mangrove butterflies. Uh, I'm not very good at butterflies, but I only know that there's a common laska that is found there. But there are other butterflies. Uh, um, unfortunately, I cannot. I, I do not know them. I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, yeah. If there are any others uh, locked in right now who are experts in butterflies, they can. Can you speak up? Uh, Lena, do you want to comment, Lena? Can okay, unmute yourself. Can she be muted? Okay, never mind. Uh, anyway, we can answer your question. Um, if you can email me, I will answer you directly privately. Okay. Any more questions, Tim? Okay, are there barracudas in Singapore? Mm, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, but the barracudas are found in Australia, which I've swam next to one before. And um, I'm not sure, sorry. Okay, there would be marine waters, but I don't think there's uh, barracudas in uh, the mangroves. But I know that for a fact that mangroves, uh, Mangroves are in other parts of the world do host young barracudas. So they, they because the mangroves are obviously, obviously more sheltered waters and uh, it's not so stormy and the young fishes can hide amongst the mangrove roots uh, against bigger fishes. Okay, so uh, barracudas, uh, as a young barracudas can be found within mangroves, but I'm not sure about Singapore. Yes. Okay, uh, this is uh, hopefully, I think the last one. Is there a mangrove preservation campaign or trail that is happening in Singapore right now? How do we sign up? I think it's a question of going to mangroves. Um, okay, when you mean preservation, I don't know whether you mean conservation, but in this case, in Singapore, the Sungai Bulo is a conserved site, meaning that you are not allowed to take any wildlife animal or trees from it. But um, okay, in terms of mangrove walks, just now I mentioned guided walks by Nature Society, uh, and MPARX itself also runs walks as Sungai Bulo. So you can check out the MPARX website. And I believe uh, other organizations like Naked Hermit Crabs also does walks that might cover uh, mangroves. Okay, um, are there any more uh, questions? Uh, how many more minutes do we have? Um, it's 10.42, so that's about uh, 18 more minutes. Three more minutes. Oh, three minutes. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. So if you have any questions, please type it in. I'll give uh I'll just uh, stay around for more, one more minute. Okay, but in the meantime, please uh, help me out in this survey. Oh, a question that's came in. Okay. Are mangrove fruits edible? Okay, uh actually if yes, they are, but but then uh yes, just now I mentioned about the atapji, which is the Nepal palm. Okay, but I, I understand that uh, the, the proper gyu, I, I believe is edible, of course, it, with a lot of cooking and all that. Yeah, but you please check it up, Google it for yourself, because I don't actually know for, uh, very, I'm not very sure about that. Yes, sorry about that. Any more questions? Um, okay, is there any more questions? It doesn't look like any more questions. Okay. Okay. So I'll end the talk here. Thank you for attending this. And uh, I hope to see you at some of my walks. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we're turning it off now.